welcome back to the CSS podcast. Today, we're talking about one of my favorite recent additions to the platform, which is the has selector. Has is a flexible selector that lets you select a parent element based on the presence of its children or the state of those children. Yes, that means we finally have a parent selector on the web, but it's actually so much more than that because combining has with combinators in CSS makes it an extremely flexible feature and also just using it to style children or siblings. And we've already seen folks do some really incredible things using has. So in this episode, we wanted to briefly cover how to use this API, a couple of potential gotchas, and then we get into some great examples of how people are taking advantage of the house selector to solve some real world problems and also just to hack around and have fun and make some cool things. Yeah, this is a super fun one. Yeah, talk about hacking around and having fun. Has is super fun and awesome. And it's much more than just selecting parents. Jay called it the family selector, which I really liked because you can traverse up and down the elements and their states and select whoever you want. Uh, you can select, <laughs> you know, only only dads that have certain types of children, or you can select the children of those kind of dads or whatever it is. You can do whatever you need and you can find a yeah, you can find a grandpa that has a nephew with three children and then select those three children. It's it's just really powerful. It can count how many children. Anyway, we'll get into some of this stuff. But exciting news about has also because it's recently landed in all the browser engines, meaning this API is now baseline. So cue that baseline baseline. Boom, 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 boom. I love teasing them about that. I'm like, how'd you call it baseline and not have a baseline? You're just, uh, I need to hear some slap of the bass. Can we, can uh, we get a little baseline, baseline vibe here for? Yeah, hey, Lucas, yeah. add a baseline. <laughs> Uh, landing in both WebKit and Chromium in 2022 and in Firefox December 2023. So that's why we're baseline now. It's not fresh out the off the out the oven, but it is uh, now. It's pretty fresh. It's just, uh, yeah. Support is good. It's in 91.81% of global uh, browsers uh, as of the recording of this episode. So it's now time to get into a bit of how you would actually use has. All right. <laughs> so we also did a quick intro to has in episode 61. So check that out if you want to do a review. But in this episode, we're going to get even deeper into has. So let's start with some basics on how you use it to get everyone up to speed. So you can use has with a selector list. A very basic way to use has is just like figure colon has fig caption, where you're checking to see if a figure has a fig caption inside of it. And then you would apply styles to the figure. Or you could do something like dot card has dot highlight image. And that way you're checking to see if a card element has a highlight image inside of it. So some kind of image with the class highlight image. So both of these would target the parent element in this case, just everything together. Yes, I like calling those the subject of the selector. I think that's even what they say in the spec, but it's just a nice term because people will call it the parent selector because it sounds like you're selecting the figure parent of a fig caption. But even more technically than that, it, that's just the subject of the selector is the figure. It's not super relevant that it's the parent. It's like, what are you trying to actually style? Are you trying to style the fig caption or the figure? And so this next example, we have figure colon has fig caption space fig caption. So now the subject of the selector is a fig caption only if it's the child of a figure that has a fig caption. So like a lonely fig caption that's not inside of a figure would not match. It's required that it's a figure with the fig. And anyway, you kind of get it so that, but the subject of that is the fig caption itself. Yes. And you can take that even further. So say you have a figure with a fig caption and inside the figure, you also have an image element. You could say figure colon has fig caption in the has selector space image. So now you'd be targeting the image. That's the subject here within the figure. So it doesn't even have to be that last element. It could be something that comes earlier in the DOM tree where you're now styling an image if its figure has a fig caption. So before that fig caption. So it grows. It grows. Yeah. And the, and the subject isn't always on the right with has. You can you can change it up. You're in control now. <laughs> it's so fun. Um, another good example is figure colon has, and that opens up a parenthesis, fig caption, and parenthesis, space plus space P would target the paragraph immediately after the figure, which is kind of cool. Yeah. And that's also useful if you wanted to create some additional spacing if it has a fig caption versus if it didn't have a fig caption um, to differentiate from the caption and the rest of the text. So you could 
definitely use this stuff in real life. These are just some basic examples. Um, and another cool thing about has is that you can combine it with selectors like not to negate the has. So you could sort of use this for like a Boolean of has. So you could do figure colon not and then open parentheses and then colon has and then open parentheses and then have fig caption inside that. So it's figure not has fig caption. I think this is actually quite a nice syntax because to me, like it reads very English. If the figure does not have a fig caption, then you're styling a figure that does not have a fig caption. <laughs> nice. Okay. Your your tweak to the grammar was good there because I'm like, not has, that's not how I, I not has hunger. You're like that's. <laughs> I think that makes sense. <laughs> well, you did well though. You're like, it does not, you do not have hunger, Adam. You need to fix your <laughs> Not <grammar>. has. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, very cool. So yeah, obviously very flexible, being able to change the subject and being able to negate and to select uh, adjacent elements that are conditional. It's it's a very conditional style selector that also gives you that power to change the subject. Yes. Very cool. Also a note on the specificity, the has pseudo class takes on the specificity of the most specific selector and its arguments. And this works the same way that is is and not do, but not the same way that where does. So it works more like is and not. Just a note on specificity if you're dealing with styling and running into things. Yeah. And also just kind of like the hot tip there is watch out if you're packing on a bunch of selectors inside of the parentheses. Uh, this is where that particular thing might come to bite you is that uh, if you put an yes. ID in there, all of a sudden your entire selector has the power of an ID, which is quite strong. Yeah. Almost better to be more specific in this case and break out your has selectors and to, to pack them in. Yeah, be selective early on, be specific early on and then use has. And yeah. that's probably gonna be in that performance tip we get to huh, in a little bit. Uh, another thing, so while Yuna just covered neg negation, you can also, uh, well, what you can't do is nest. So you can't have a has inside of a has, but you can chain the has. So you can't do figure colon has open parentheses, you know, figure caption colon has code. So if there was code inside of a fig caption that was inside of a figure, um, that's not going to work. And ultimately the subject of that one too was the figure, but you can all, you know, change it around to say figure colon has open parentheses, fig caption and parentheses. So now your subject here is a figure that has a caption, but you're going to chain has code. So you're still selecting the figure, you're getting the same result, but you're just not nesting, you're chaining instead. Um, I guess you could also do in that case, just like figure has code, but you, there's many cases that you'd want to chain nest uh, has for. There's yeah. a lot of use cases for that. Um, so also speaking of checking for multiple things, uh, you can have multiple selectors in the selector list for has. So you could check for something like main has h2 comma h3. Uh, this would be essentially like styling a main element that has either an h2 or an h3. So you could have either to match. This is so much like uh, SQL. <laughs> You know, like we're very much writing a query language that's looking up an unknown document uh, size and you're writing all these conditions. And so, yeah, the or with a has. Uh, yeah, uh, I really like the syntax of this feature. It's really cool. I'd kind of want to query a database with this syntax. I bet somebody's done it. Uh, all right. Our next little feature that we want to talk about is that the selector list in has is not forgiving. So Yuna covered earlier that it takes the highest specificity of the item in the selector list, but it is also not forgiving. So if you put something in that selector list that's maybe one browser specific or not, uh, it won't work. It will negate the whole line. So this was a resolution that was reversed in 2022 because of jQuery. The Here's the quote, the forgiving nature of has breaks jQuery when used with a complex has selector, end quote. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, it means if you have an invalid selector in the list, the entire line is ignored, like I just uh, was explaining. But let's imagine really quick here that there's a pseudo element called meow, <laughs> colon, colon, meow, uh, which is obviously not valid, though. Um, maybe there's a way to make it valid. Where's uh, Jonathan Neal when you need him? He's like, oh, I can make meow a valid element, <laughs> uh, which I love that. Create your own AST, uh, parse it through something. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, oh yeah, stop me. Uh, he's just great for uh, rising to challenges. Okay, so let's say you have main colon has open parentheses h2 comma h3. So if a main has an h2 or an h3, and then you say comma colon colon meow, well, then the entire line would be invalid because there is no meow. So everything inside the selector list becomes invalidated because uh, it's not forgiving. An error was made. Something was un unattainable inside of the selector list. Therefore, the whole line is toast. But what you could do as a workaround is you can say main colon has open up your parentheses and 
add a selector in there that is forgiving. And we have the where selector is a forgiving selector and it takes a list also. So you would say colon where open up parentheses h2 comma h3 comma colon colon meow and then end both of your parentheses. And now this is valid because it will still find an h2 or an h3. It's forgiving inside of the has before has even knew that there was something unforgiving happening inside of there. So you, you trick it. It's kind of cool. Yeah, nice tip. Um, so speaking of tips, let's talk about some tips and tricks. We already talked about some of the basics of has and some basic usage and how to use it, um, like to check the presence of a child with figure has fig caption. We also talked about how you can use this for states or mentioned that at least like you could have card has hover where you'd be able to style a card based on if any of its children were hovered. That, that one's actually really useful. Yeah. Hover within basically. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Essentially hover within. This technique can also be a stand in for focus within because you could do like nav has focus focus where that would be similar to nav focus within. So uh, actually using this for states is super, super useful. I've definitely done that a few times. Yep. I feel like we covered that in the episode 61 too. We were like every pseudo state that there is, is now super power to use with yeah. has, uh, which is cool. Uh, and so uh, as we we're talking about has, you can use it for advanced selection too, like as an image element within a figure or the paragraph that follows it. And finally, we've already mentioned that you can combine it with other selectors like not and where. Um, but let's get into some really interesting and complex examples of using has like games and et cetera. Yeah. What, what, what do we, what do you got? Where are you starting? Well, the first one, the first very uh, useful use of has for me is quantity queries. So this uh, yeah. is where you would determine a layout or styling of a parent or the children from the parent based on the number of children that it has. So this has definitely come up to a few times in my life. Um, one example I like to give is in my previous role, I was designing a publishing site where at the end of this page, you could sometimes have an article that had a lot of photographers, hairdressers, models, like credits to give people who are contributing as a part of it. Um, and I had to build this in JavaScript where if it had four or fewer you know, credits, then I wanted the layout to sort of be block layout where it was one on top of the other to take up a nice amount of space. But if it was a bunch, like say five or more, I wanted this to take up less space because it just like looks like a long list. So have those appear in line. So what you can do is use has and use it with nth child to then apply the styling. You can do something like, in this case, it's a list. So ul has nth child n plus five. This would then style the parent if it had, you know, five or more items next to each other within it. Um, so then you could build on that where in this case, I have UL has nth child n plus five space li. Now I'm styling the list items, not the parent. So now if it was five or more items, I would display inline. Um, and also I combined this with not, and I did like a little trick to add a semicolon after each item, except for the last mm -hmm. item in that list. So now not only am I displaying them inline, but I have a line of code that is UL has nth child n plus five, so five from our items, li, so space li, not colon last child, colon colon after. So I'm applying the styling to every list item except for the item that is the last child. And as a after, you know, pseudo element, it has the content semicolon that is creating that space. So I, I thought this was like a fun little clever thing that was really hard to do without has. And now it's just couple lines of code, like some clever styling, mixing has and not. And once you know the trick of how to use these features, really, really helpful. Very cool example. I've had to do similar tricks like that in my UI days as well, whether it's um, adding commas, you're adding semicolons. Very cool trick. Um, I've got one here that's a grid styling based on the number of items. So another one that's quantity queries. And the way that I wrote it, so I said like, I called this one the always great grid because I'm counting the amount of children and I'm adapting the grid layout based on how many children there are. We've all had this problem mm -hmm. where it's like, oh, uh, five items. Well, that means there's a cliffhanger somewhere or a dingleberry or whatever you want to call it. And you can style that now by querying how many items are there. So in the, here, a good example of this is in the case of five. Normally someone might take that fifth item and stretch it to the full width. I actually take the first item and I do by that by saying uh, the always great grid selector. So it's a class that's just the, the container for uh, this layout. And it says colon has, do I have a direct child that is the last child that is the nth child five? So I look to see is the last one, the fifth one. 
And that would mean that I have a list of five items and then I end my parenthesis for has because I want my subject to be the first child. So I do direct descendant selector colon first child and I say, hey, you span two columns and that's it. So now it is the promoted item at the top of the list. And then I have four nicely placed grid items below it. And then this particular demo, I kept going with this where I added a button where you could add more items and you could remove items and you would see the grid adapt to two items, three items, four items, five items. Uh, and then I also used view transitions so it was animated. And the last little kicker I did was it's in portrait or landscape, you get different layouts. So we just talked about the first uh, child spanning two columns. But if I'm in a landscape layout, I want the first item to span two rows. Uh, that way it gets a promoted look in the landscape layout. So that's why I called it the always great grid because it counts children, it knows if it's in a portrait or landscape layout, and it adapts and presents itself perfectly in all cases. Thank you, Haz. I love this example because it's so practical too. Just the number of times that I have done a parent class to apply styles ahead of time to prepare some kind of gallery design layout. Even on my blog, I need to update it because I haven't in a while, um, where I have interstitial inside the blog, like different little galleries of images. I could just do this with has. I don't have to apply like a two by or three by class or four by based on the number of children. I could just have a gallery and then use has, do a quantity query and apply the styling based on the number of children dynamically. Like that's the way. So when I refactor my blog and just, uh, maybe I'll do that tonight if I have time. <laughs> Nice. I think I got the uh, the trick too for the selecting inside of has where you say the last child is nth child five. I think I got that one from Michelle Barker um, as, a, as a great strategy Michelle. for counting. Yeah. Shout out to Michelle. Always at the edge. So good. Yeah. This is super, super useful. I love that quantity queries are so much easier to create now with has. Yeah. Rad. Okay. So you can also use has on the body which has lots of different effects and cool things you can do with one caveat that the more the complex selector that you put in here can slow down your application. And if you have a very large page with a lot of DOM elements, this one can uh, could cause some performance issues because it does have to go up and down the tree. You're asking for a lot of work. So earlier we were saying, you know, be specific early on. Mm -hmm. That'll help these things out. So like here's an example. Let's say you want to remove uh, the ability for the page to scroll when a dialog is open. And that's pretty critical because no one likes being able to like scroll the background while they're trying to scroll the dialogue. And you can do that one very simply now with has. You say body colon has open parenthesis dialogue open bracket with the open attribute. So is a dialogue in the open state inside of the body? If so, style the body because again, the, su the subject here is still the body, not the dialogue. And we can set the over scroll to hidden. Another one is you can style the body if a menu is open. So this could, uh, like if a popover is open, you could slide in a side menu. I think you have a very wicked tweet that did really well that used this technique. Yeah, um, yeah. For the slide out menu, yeah, using has. And then another one is theming. So of course, if you've got a, a switch on your page that's holding some state about the selected theme color that someone wants, you can target body, say colon has, what is the state of this theme? And then you can change all your custom properties to something else. So there's a lot of really cool powers with using has on the body or has on root, whatever is uh, that you need to put it. Yeah, that, that could be super useful. I liked your performance caveat because um, I remember Tailwind was doing this uh, on the root and they had like some really, really specific selector for some color on some button and a huge DOM tree on their homepage. And it ended up having some performance slowdowns, but really just test because it doesn't necessarily have to. There's a lot of factors there, um, but very useful technique. I've seen a lot of examples of this where you're kind of going up the tree. You know, you mentioned the grandparent selector. <laughs> this is this could be like a great, 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 great grandparent selector. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, use with caution. Um, another funky technique that I first saw uh is from a deer code. It's a deer code on Twitter. His website is a deer, a D I R dot dev. And it is filtering with has using tags. So I actually use this on my personal blog now because it was just such an easy way to do filtering for blog posts and without any JavaScript, just using has. So the way that you set this up is I'm essentially using check boxes or like check marks for my posts. So I have this whole filter bar. So it's showing posts about and then everything. So yes, that's HTML, JavaScript, design, performance, uh, personal posts. When you uncheck these, 
then it removes any posts about that topic. So if I click on them, because these are essentially labels for a checkbox, it'll remove mm -hmm. those posts so you can get more and more filtered as you go. Um, and it does this automatically. And you can also apply the transitions with this. So it does like a cool animation. So you can like build on this. But ultimately, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the way that you set this up is first, I check for support because that's important. This is like a pretty critical feature where I don't want all of my posts to be display none only if the support for has is there. Do I set yeah. all of my posts to display none? Okay, so we don't have any weird browser support issues. So I have at support selector has a just checking for at supports inside of that everything that's a dot post so a post card display none and then I have this filter bar where I'm checking if the filter bar has CSS tag checked. So if the state of that CSS tag, which is you know an ID on um, a check mark check box. Uh, then look for the adjacent sibling. So using that sort of curly selector, uh, which is in posts. And if the post inside of posts has data tag equals and the data tag, which is CSS, HTML, JavaScript, whatever it is that aligns to uh, the name or the thing that I am showing, then display block that item. So this sounds like a lot of things. I'm going to do a quick review. All my posts are hidden. Then I check if the filter bar has a tag that is checked, look for inside of the adjacent uh, sibling combinator inside the posts. If a post inside of posts has a data tag that matches the filter bar, then display block. So you get all this functionality with no JavaScript, just using has. And it's progressively enhanced here where I'm just checking for support. If not, then you don't have the filter bar and you also don't display none the posts so that users can still see the posts. Um, hopefully that helped to explain <laughs> how this all worked. But I thought it was a really cool use of has. So I wanted to implement it on my page. It is a cool use of has. And it just gave me a demo idea that I've never seen anybody do. It's combining your uh, technique here with a recent blog post I had about using starting style and transition behavior on anything. Mm. And so the whole condition though, of that particular uh, blog post was that you're animating to and from display none, which you're doing right here. Mm -hmm. So if you say starting style is opacity zero, um, then when they get presented, they're going to animate in and they're going to fade in. And then you can say transition behavior allow discrete on the display none. So if they check a checkbox, anything that gets hidden is going to fade out and then get display none applied. You can literally animate the entry and exit of these elements from the stage, always CSS using has and some checkboxes. Oh, bam! That's a great idea. I need to add starting style and those entry and exit effects to this. This was definitely out before those entry and exit effects yeah, landed. Definitely. This stuff is fresh. Yeah. But I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm going to do that. Progressive enhancement, animation for the win. Yeah. Always make sure to use prefers reduced motion, everybody. And yeah. at supports for the has selector if it's a critical user interaction. Totally. Nice. Well, very cool demo. It was obviously so cool and inspiring that uh, it's going to add. I'll add this demo to my list of demos that I need to make. <laughs> I have an ever growing uh, inspirational list of things to build. All right. So we got another example here. This one is the Apple style dock where the icons scale up based on. So if you hover in the middle of the dock, the adjacent um, icons are scaled up in proportion to those. So if you're hovered on the middle one, the two next to it are slightly smaller. The two next to that are slightly smaller. Etc. There's a really rad talk from Sana at CSS Day last year. You have to watch this. I mean, the whole talk was absolutely incredible anyway. Um, talking about like pendulums and different mathematical sine waves. So what they did is they they built this with a sine wave so that when you hovered on the middle one, it wasn't just like, you know, 0.25 scale smaller on the ones adjacent. Uh, he made it a curve and then you could also control the curve. So you think about in the dock demo, like on Mac OS, you can set it to large, right? So you hover on the middle one and it's very large and then you get this nice curved scale from the adjacent elements that are there. He did it all with math, uh, built in the curve. And um, what we have now though, is Bramus has made a demo. And I think I've made one somewhat similar as well because the has selector normal. Okay. So normally in CSS, you can only uh, select the elements after one. So you can say siblings after me, there is no previous sibling selector, but the has 
selector allows you to select adjacent siblings on both sides of yourself and any number of directions from there, one to two uh, away from you in both directions, up the tree and down the tree. So Bramus has a demo that does this. They're like, oh, I don't, I don't have a cool sine wave curve like Sana did, but I do have a, a quite simplified version that uses has. And uh, allow me to CSS mouth podcast some code <laughs> for you, and we'll see how well this goes. Okay. So the li that you're hovering is going to be dot doc. So that's the selector for the context of the doc, li colon hover. So the one that you're hovering over has a width of three. And then you have dot doc space li colon hover and the image inside of there. So space image translate zero space negative 15%. So he's using the new uh, shorthand for um, transforms. So the individual transforms is what they're called as opposed to the transform property, which takes a list. So anyway, he's translating X and Y there with some percentages. Then the element before and after the hovered LI. So here's the kind of crucial part we wanted to talk about. We have the one that's after, which is very simple, which is dot doc space LI colon hover plus LI. So that's the sibling after me. But how do you select the one before you? Well, you say dot doc space LI colon has open parentheses. So we're no longer an LI hover, we're an LI has plus li colon hover inside of it. So you're looking at the element that the one right after it is being hovered. Therefore, this is the one just in front of the hovered element. And you can set the width of those two items to point or 2.5m. So the one before you and the one after you are 2.5m. The one that you're hovering on is 3m. And you can also, just like how we changed the translate, you can change the translates of those items uh, just like they did before. So super duper cool. Um, I also did something very similar in a mini web machine where I used the looper, which is like a radio group essentially. And I used the checked pseudo selector to promote the selected one. So it's not a hover example. This is a checked example. So I'm looking at the checked element and I make sure that one's promoted. It looks nice and big. But for some cool visual intrigue, I select the one just before it and just after it and scale them uh, slightly about half of what that other one was. And then I also animated grid template columns. So I have like grid template columns being animated using the has selector, looking at the ones before and after and a radio group of checked element. And it creates this really cool, I made a plant picker so you could pick a monstera, pick a pothos, whatever. Um, and it, as you use the keyboard, the one that's selected gets this really cool promoted view. Anyway, has. You know, it's cool. Really cool. I love that example. I think that's a great example of the power of has too, where previously, as you mentioned, you could only select after the, you know, subject. Now you can select before it. And that's something we've never had before. Uh, it was super cool to kind of see that live at CSS Day. It's super cool to like see this also simplified version of it that feels like really approachable um, using has. So like lots using of has. cool stuff. Um, there's also a lot of cool games and things that you could do with CSS. So uh, I tweeted out if anyone's seen like a cool use case of has recently. And Scott Gell replied and shared a post that he had recently written about how he recreated Wordle with just HTML and CSS leveraging has. The crux of this is essentially it's a table. I mean, if you look at the source, you know the word. <laughs> but uh, within the table, you have all of these um you have table rows, like inside of this, you have like these table cells where you have an input and that input has a specific pattern. I also think that this is a very underused HTML feature. The pattern. Pattern. Attribute yes. of inputs. Yeah, exactly. I agree. So uh, the pattern there is, you know, the letters that you can use. And then uh, essentially you submit these when this would be either valid or invalid once you enter the text. And he's using has in a couple of ways. So the first way is to sort of uh, invalidate the area only when you're not focused on it. So this is like, if you have your TR, like your cell there, not has input, placeholder shown, and the input is focused. Then if the input type equals text is invalid, so that input is invalid, it doesn't match the pattern, the background color is like gray. So it grays it out. It doesn't work for that uh, element. Oh, also, I will say there's no yellow, Scott. I was very confused because I was like, when I played this game first, uh, usually yellow in Wordle means that the word letter exists, but it's not in the right spot. This only has, is it the right letter in the right spot or is it not? <laughs> he mentions that in his blog post. He's like, yeah. there's one feature cliffhanging. I, maybe I could figure it out yeah. one day, but he's like, I stopped here. But it was a creative example. So I'm going to keep talking about it anyway. Um, yeah. So you get either light gray or if it's valid, you get the light green background. 
Um, there's also a neat feature where he's using has to disallow any pointer events until the previous row has been populated. Oh, nice. That was clever. So you can't just like type further on. So you have your table row. TR has input placeholder shown and then uh, adjacent sibling selector TR space input comma TR not has input placeholder shown comma input focus. So also after you're done focusing the input, then have pointer events none. So this disallows it until you've finished with the input. Um, and then he also uses has to like announce the win. So there's a couple of different use, uses of has here. Um, validate only the non-focused populated row. Uh, I'm not going to get into all of the uses of has because there's a few of them, but it's really fun to see this combination of pattern you know, input and has to recreate this version of Wordle in HTML and CSS. And we'll we'll link a the post also up in the show notes and you could check it out. There's a demo in there. Um it's very fun. It's funky. I got two two comments there. Uh setting pointer event, events from CSS means that a keyboard user could still get in there. Yes. Which means that this is a good argument for being able to inert things from CSS. We can mouse inert things from CSS, but we can't actually inert things from keyboards or screen readers. So uh, we only have a partial implementation of mm. something that clearly people want to do. They want to be able to visually inert something or just do it from CSS based on some other kind of logic. So that's kind of a cool thing. I think we need to have more control over inert in general, like the ability to inert the page with something like a popover if you wanted, where you could control uh, you know, focus, that, like if you wanted to manage circular focus inside of a popover. Like these are options I think developers want to have. And I don't know if it's necessarily because they like the ergonomics of popover, which we're going to get with invokers, or if it's the ability to kind of cycle within any kind of experience or trap focus. Um, that's an aside. <laughs> yeah, that was an aside. I have another aside too, which is uh, the, the placeholder shown example with focus and placeholder shown. Those are methods to work around user invalid and user mm, valid. Yeah which we now have so that um, yeah he could totally use user invalid and user valid here yeah which would uh make the code a little bit simpler yeah. and achieve the same effect um scott gel very cool though gotta say all right do you have any cool games you want to talk about that use has yeah i got a uh, jay made uh so jay did for like about a year all sorts of really rad um they looked three-dimensional um but it was like mocked 3d which is sort of like boxes that he was positioning in 3d and kind of I mean, it was, it was 3D. It was, it was a 3D rendered mm -hmm. CSS scene with perspective. And he would make these. So anyway, he did Connect 4 and built the whole thing with has. And it's the code is out of control. You can tell that he built it up just brick by brick, <laughs> you know, with a with a plan that he had and then eventually got into the mayhem. But the mayhem all works. So you complete the game. It takes turns between two players. You drop your pieces into the top of a 3D looking Connect 4 thing. Um, and it was all just a has experiment that I believe this one tripped him up for a couple of days too, but he eventually got it. And uh, I, 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 this is what I would have done if I was him. But once it worked, I would have ran around the room dancing, you know, like, <laughs> ha, 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 ha. Uh, and then I'd sit back down again and be like, okay, let's get serious. And um, it looks awesome. Like it is a beautiful 3D tic-tac-toe board and you can like hover the pieces at the top and drop them in. So really, really complex CSS game made out of no JavaScript. Yep, very cool. I love that. This kind of reminds me, um, years ago, I was- Back in my day. A long time ago. <laughs> I um, I was interviewing for a company, and the interview question was to create a tic-tac-toe game, right? Like, you know, just build it. Um, so I ended up building it with CSS only. <laughs> the tic-tac-toe game, like it took turns with animations, and uh, this was a while ago. And then I used- Ultimately, like just checking for every position possible, like value with checkboxes um, for the tic tac toe positions to identify if you won or not. So I would check for X's and O's that way. And it was super, super long, you know, selectors to be able to do that. Has really, really simplifies this. Like using has could really shorten that code. I kind of want to rebuild the tic-tac-toe now. I'm sure somebody has at this point uh, using has. I'm sure if I Google tic-tac-toe with has, I'll find it right away. Um, but that was really fun, like a fun little brain uh, vibe, a little experiment to see if it was possible. And now I'm getting the itch to do it again with has because I, I feel like you really can. 
uh, feel the itch. That's what this yes. show is good for. We make you itchy. Itchy to write CSS. Now I'm Googling has tic-tac-toe. No <laughs> JS has tic-tac-toe. Uh, mm, I'm not finding it right away, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist because it must. It must. It must. All right. Are we... Are we at the I think end we're episode? done. Yeah, we're we're feeling the end here. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, we went from like being su- you were so inspired that the <laughs> show kind of ended as you drifted away. <laughs> I hope you, as a listener, <laughs> have done the same thing that you didn't make it this far because you were like, I gotta go use ass somewhere. <laughs> I know, right? I'm still looking for it. I'm sure it exists. Oh no. Well, don't worry. I'll just recap everything. I'll I'll do the ending credits here while you continue your search. Yeah, yeah, Thank right. you all for joining <laughs> us on the CSS podcast. If you have any CSS questions, we'd love to answer on the show. Just tweet us with the hashtag CSS podcast. I'm Yuna at UNA <laughs> and I'm also at Art Link at A R G Y L E I N K. Question can help a lot of people. And if you like this show, give us a review on whatever podcast app you're using or share this with a friend. Those reviews, they help other people discover our show, help us have time to deliver better content for you. Hey, Adam, you, it's your turn to say thank you. Looking forward your questions and <laughs> Una, it's time for you to say we'll see you next time <laughs> bye everyone thank you adam i'll just have you do that for the rest of the episodes this season <laughs> <No>. <laughs> see y'all